Erica, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Jeff? Good to I'm, see you. I'm great. Good afternoon. Good it's, afternoon. Uh, it's Warriors game day, so I'm... Sweating. Go Dubs. Yeah. I know. How can we not all be Warriors fans here in the Bay Area? <laughs> Somebody just tweeted out a picture of Luca grabbing a beer yesterday somewhere in San Francisco. So uh, I think when you have like six, eight, seven foot people sitting outside drinking beer, they're not hard, they're not hard to spot. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, we're ready. All right. Well, let's jump in. Hey, um, so I think people would just love to hear a little bit about you, your background. Obviously, we at GGV know you well. A lot of folks from the tech ecosystem know you well. But just a little bit of your background and sort of how you got to where you are, I think would be awesome. Sure. I, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start at the beginning. I, uh, I kind of stumbled into this tech world and I've been in, uh, enterprise tech for 27 years now. Um, but I was a Spanish like major. Sorry. <laughs> Since you were like eight. Since I was eight. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was a Spanish major in college and I want to start there because, you know, I'm a huge fan of getting, encouraging more people to pursue STEM degrees, especially getting more diverse talent to pursue STEM degrees, but I'm also a huge fan of, you know, sharing with people, like I wanna get the message out. You don't have to have a computer science degree to play a role in this incredible industry. And um, so I feel really fortunate to have come out of college with my Spanish major. And uh, I, was, I, was a, I was a government major, so. Uh, I love it, right. Liberal arts, a good liberal arts degree can carry you exactly. far. But I often say that, or maybe upon reflection, you know, I would say that, um, it's been, you know, curiosity, um, my competitive nature, and my love of coaching um, that has really, I think, led me not only into this industry, but into the role that I'm in. And I'll talk about, you know, a little bit of each of those. Um, I think, you know, curiosity, even starting with the Spanish major, like I loved, it was a Spanish and Latin American studies major, and I love learning the language and learning about different cultures. And I have found that throughout you know, my career at Enterprise Tech, that it's been a lot of learning and being curious about not only um, new tech and learning to speak a new language, especially in infrastructure tech, I've really had to like put myself to school, um, but also you know, serving different enterprises, learning about so many different companies and industries and business models and cultures. So that curiosity and that love of, of learning all those things has carried me really far. Um, my competitive nature, I grew up a competitive swimmer. That was my first love in life was the sport of swimming out in the East Bay, in the Bay Area, which is swimming country, as you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I found that, you know, as much as I kind of stumbled into sales coming right out of college, I started as an SDR, the competitive spirit of that organization, that function, like sucked me in. Yeah. And it's really kept me here. You know, I love the industry. Um, but being on the front lines in sales and go to market has just really fueled that competitive spirit. Um, so that's been really great. Um, and then my first real job when I was in kind of late high school, early college was as a coach for a competitive swim team. And I found that as much as I love being an athlete, I love being a coach even more and, and just, you know, unlocking potential in athletes in those days, like unlocking the individual potential and then unlocking the potential of teams and so that opportunity to build and develop high performing teams and unlock potential is, is, has been a big source of motivation for me. I got into uh, management and leadership pretty early at Oracle, just a couple of years in. And I love being in a leadership position where, you know, my job is to unlock the potential in individuals and in teams and really build high performing organizations. So those are three themes that have really fueled me. And it's, you know, you like you do, you go through your career. I don't know if you can relate, you kind of do these things and then you look back and you see the patterns mm -hmm. and you're like, Oh, that's <laughs> why I love what I do. Right. It's because I'm competitive and because I believe in coaching and all those things. So um, 27 years in now I can finally do a little bit of the pattern matching. <laughs> it's amazing how many great sales organizations today have Oracle DNA. I mean, I don't know what was in the water back then, but you know, you think about sale, obviously Salesforce, but yeah, there's so many organizations today with people that started back in the time in the nineties in Oracle, it really was yeah. like the talent farm for sales today. Cool. Well, it was growth tech too. Yeah. I mean, what, we weren't competing with all these like small pre-IPO companies. It kind of was the destination. And at least for early career talent like me, it was a great learning opportunity. There was really structured enablement. 
Um, we were winning. And if we were in markets where we weren't yet winning, we were committed to winning. So it's just a great place to, to learn. I learned a ton and I stayed there for 17 years. Wow. Yeah. So fast forward to talk about your role today, what you're yeah. doing today and, and the company a little bit. So I'm president of field operations at Confluent. Um, we are a data streaming platform and um, I've been here for about two and a half years, started pre-IPO. We went public just about a year ago um, and, uh, and just cra- crossed the um, half a billion uh, ARR run rate mark, which we're wow. super excited about. That's amazing. So, um, it's an exciting milestone. Um, and, uh, you know, I started two and a half years ago pre-IPO. This is my second kind of pre-IPO through IPO gig. I spent five and a half years at New Relic before this. And I love this stage and scale because you come into a company that, you know, when I joined New Relic, we were about 50 million in error. When I joined Confluent, we were maybe 150. Um, and so you have this great, all this evidence of product market fit and all this early success and yet, you know, companies at that stage often haven't yet built the systems for scale mm-hmm. that allow you to, you know, be IPO ready and then scale to and through half a billion, a billion, et cetera. And that's what I love to do. And so it's everything from, um, you know, architecting the right um, team and talent to thinking about, okay, what's our go to market strategy, our segment strategy, our business model, you know, what markets are we prioritizing, et cetera, to drive that growth. So I get to do that as part of an amazing team at Confluent. And what is that? I mean, so you join New Relic at 50, you join Confluent around 150. And, you know, like you said, a lot of companies get to that stage. And we have a lot of companies in our universe, but there's a lot of companies in tech in general that are kind of in that 50 to 150 stage. What are the biggest gaps that you see? And is it is it kind of everything? Is it systems and process and analytics and team? Or are there a couple of things that when you walked into Confluent, you say, okay, I've got a little bit of a playbook here. I, I know the, the things we got to prioritize and tackle. I'm just curious, you know, if I'm a founder or a CEO or a go-to-market exec and I'm listening right now and thinking, gosh, what could I, you know, where do I have gaps that maybe I don't know about? And, and could you yeah. point me to some of those? Yeah, you know, I um, there are a few things that I think have become um pretty near and dear to my heart when I think about the play the playbook and what has to be in place. And it's always a game of like, of course, our job as revenue leaders, you know, first and foremost is to deliver quarter in quarter out. So like near term execution, that's price of entry, that's table stakes. And then you have to layer on top of it. Okay. How am I building for the next chapter um, of growth in scale? And you have to balance those two things, but Mm -hmm. starting with like, how do you deliver performance kind of quarter in quarter out? I, I do think in terms of like a few key systems, and I'll name five that have to be in place that you want to build if they're not yet there. And I would say in both companies, when I joined, they weren't yet there. And these are um, things that are a constant work in progress. You're never done, but you have to spend a lot of energy um, getting them right. So by the way, both with- these companies, when you joined, were very successful, very oh, well funded, yeah. very highly valued. So it wasn't like they were broken. You joined good companies. They just didn't have these five things in place. A hundred percent. And it's, so when I name them, you'll see like, okay, a pipeline generation system. So were both companies producing pipeline? Sure. But was it in a way that was like repeatable, predictable, scalable? Not yet. Um, so pipe gen is a huge one. Um, hiring and ramping account executives in other roles, but starting with your, you know, your core quota carrying reps, can you hire and enable and ramp predictably in any region in the world? Mm -hmm. And how can you rein in that ramp and increase your odds for success? That's a huge system that, um, that has to to come back to that one. Cause I feel like every company struggles with that. It's super (laughs) hard. It's a hard one. Yeah. It's super hard. Um, another one is customer success. So can you reliably, like once your customers sign the contract, um, can you get them successful and live and thriving and, you know, um, realizing value? So that customer success motion um, is super important. Doesn't mean you have to have a, there are lots of ways to get at it. Maybe it's a customer success team, maybe it's something else, but that's a super important system. Um, Another one, obviously, is just sales execution. So call it from stage two to close. Okay, once you've generated pipeline and something's been declared a viable opportunity, you know, what's your conversion rate um, on that pipeline? How can you constantly tweak the sales process to shorten your sales cycles, increase win rates, all of those things? So, you know, sales execution. And the last one I kind of put in the top five 
is actually planning, like mm-hmm. capacity planning, building your annual operating plan, eventually your long range plan, um, including, you know, sales comp plan design. But that's a muscle that has to be like, you know, well formed by the time you go public, because now you're going out to the market and you're saying, here's what we're going to do. And you have to have confidence, you know how to deliver on that. So those are those are five systems that I think, first and foremost, um, I want to get in ship shape. And, and let me come back because I think the people side of this is, I mean, a lot of systems, processes, there's, there's some science there. The people side of your job is so hard. And yeah. how, what have you learned over the years? What could you share with people? I mean, I can't tell you how often we have board meetings or conversations or I meet with CROs or, and it's just like people, 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 people. I mean, building a company is all about people, but maybe share right. some of the things you've learned. And it kind of ties into that hiring ramping thing, but like, just broadly, and you shared some great anecdotes over the years with our founders about people, but just share some thoughts on people and culture and teams. Yeah, I mean, I think um, starting with like the leadership. So um, if I'm, if those five things I mentioned are super core to, you know, executing in the near term and the medium term, then I need to make sure I have a leadership team who knows how to go off and and build those systems and help them thrive. Mm-hmm. And um, so, for example, as I'm interviewing, say, sales VPs at different levels and in different regions, I really want to click down and understand, like, um, because a lot of people have lived in these systems at their prior companies, but do they really understand what makes them tick and how to build them? And so I kind of get down into the, you know, the granular, like, well, tell me how you did that. How did your pipe gen system work at such and such company? Or what was your system to hire and onboard reps, you know, your prior company? So I'm kind of looking for that systems thinking and that awareness of like, what made the system tick in past company? I think that's super important. Um, I think a lot of those systems are really cross-functional. And you've heard me say this before, I believe, particularly at senior levels, Hiring leaders who work well with other leaders is so important because if you think about it, and I've seen this so many times, like pipe channels, a marketing's job, is it sales job? Well, it kind of, it, yes, like it, it is everybody's job, but within that, you have to have like really clear defined roles, responsibilities, and you need leaders who know how to lead across, like inside their organization and into other organizations to get something done. So I just, I, I totally believe in that. So um, I think a lot about, you know, those capabilities, I guess, and and leadership is everything to your point. It's like, you got to start with the right leaders who have the right what, and then the right how they're also building a culture as they're doing all of this. Um, And, and then a lot of the other things really fall into place. And how much weighting do you put on experience in your industry? You know, one of the questions we get a lot from CEOs when they're building a leadership team is, gosh, I like this person, but they really aren't. You know, they haven't ever sold SMBs or they haven't done cloud infrastructure or they, how do you think about industry experience versus just like raw skill set? Yeah, it's a great question. And, um, you know, it's always a balance. And of course, as you scale and the teams get, you know, bigger, you do have to get better at bringing in people from kind of adjacent um, companies, if you will, or industries, and then training them up a little bit. You know, for example, when I first got to Confluent, a lot of our early talent came from Cloudera and Hortonworks because they were in the data space. And I was told, oh, anybody who doesn't have a background in open source won't be successful here. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, gosh, that's kind of a limited market. You know, we better better figure out how to hire really successful people from other companies and make them successful here. So certainly for like your reps and SCs and, and roles like that. You want to eventually have, you know, an enablement program that you believe in that um, that can ramp people up. That being said, not everything's, you know, transferable. So, for example, um, we're in the cloud infra- cloud and data infrastructure world. We have a, um, you know, big part of our motion is like a product led motion, kind of the bottoms up motion. So people coming from like the big application sale, like Workday, like this actually isn't maybe mm. an easy transition. Um, so, you know, just as an example, it might work, but yeah. is it, I just highlight that as like a, um, uh, you know, one example. So, um, so, so that's why it's always a balance. Yeah. It's, all, you know, I also don't want to over rotate on like, okay, anybody from the cloud infrastructure world's a perfect fit. Well, no, like smart people who are systems thinking and who are like good learners, um, a number of them can, can make the transition. 
And what have you found in the best sales execs and sales leaders? Like, is there, you know, do you see a 25 year old or a 30 year old that's up and coming and you go, that person's going to be one of my RVPs at some point. Uh, are there things you look for or you see, or is it, or is it just all performance based or any, anything you've seen along? Cause one of the challenges is, you know, when you're running a private technology company, you can't recruit the same, you can't pay and you can't recruit the same caliber of people that you can yeah. when you're a, a larger organization. And so yeah. very often, a lot of our private technology companies are taking a bet on somebody who doesn't have the 15 yeah. years proven track record, but they're looking for those signals that they could scale into that role. Anything you found along the way where you've been like, man, if I see X, Y, or Z. Yeah. 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 I mean, Totally. I mean, it's definitely performance. Like that's always one ingredient. And then I'm looking for a lot of the, like the meta stuff of like, is this person committed to their own development? Do they seek out mentorship and coaching? Do they have a growth mindset? Um, are they good at playing with others, you know, across the team? Um, and, um, you know, and are they a systems thinker and are they a builder and can they bring structure and shape to things there that don't exist yet? For example, as you're a growing company, you know, um, really codifying, like, what is the sales motion and starting with what is the customer journey? How do they discover us? How do they adopt us? And then codifying that into a sales motion and a marketing motion, even, um, I think early stage leaders need to be great at that. And so you're not going to get that necessarily from 20 years experience. You might be early in your career, but if you mm -hmm. can like bring structure and shape to something that's not yet codified, that's a huge skill set. Yeah. So I look for evidence of those types of things. It's funny that I think that is one of the big problems in private enterprise software companies. People think they have a playbook and there's no playbook. Yeah. And right. they're like, well, we're hiring 15 reps and we're giving them the playbook. And it's like, well, what is the playbook? If you dig in, it's a little yeah. random. We landed this customer because of this and this customer yeah. because of this. And the founder sold this one. And right. so being able to articulate that customer journey and why they buy and who buys and how they buy and getting the teams into a consistent motion around it is super yeah. hard. It's really I, hard. It is really hard. I totally agree with you. And I've come to believe it's so important. So the other thing I would say, like what's kind of in that early set of things that I might focus on, it's that. It's starting with, because the beautiful thing about a customer journey is um, when you have shared understanding of that from the founder CEO to, you know, go-to-market leadership, CMO, product leaders, shared understanding of that is very grounding across the functions. It's both the customer journey and then what are the personas that are involved in that customer journey on the customer side. For example, you know, in our world, we have developers, architects, technology executives, you know, slash economic buyers. Having clarity on what role each of them plays in the journey and then how do we need to serve each of those roles is really grounding mm -hmm. in terms of what we're going to prioritize from like a marketing message and motion to a selling motion to what goes into the product. So I think, and that's oftentimes where I spend a lot, you know, a good amount of time with, um, well, the whole executive team, but starting with, you know, our founder, CEO, Jay, um, to our head of product, head of marketing, we all stay super aligned. I'm like, are you seeing this? Or do we believe that? Is it the developers or the architects? Is it this, mm. is it that? So um, hugely important. And I think something that, you know, boards should be um, informed on, like as a forcing function of, do we have clarity? on what this is for our It's company. a hard one though, because I think there is, uh, I was just having this conversation with the CEO yesterday. The, the team wants the board to think they've got it all figured out. Always, of course. <laughs> and, and the board kind of knows they don't have it figured out. And so you, you just need to have this open conversation of like, we don't have it figured out. And, you know, here are the, here are the cases we're seeing that are doing X and Y and Z, and we're trying to work through these things. But you know, as you know, when you grow, and some of these companies have gone from 50 to 250 people in the last 24 months, by the way, doing yeah. it all remote, which is something I want to ask you about. Yeah. I don't, I think there's a lot less consistency out there than people think. And totally. Yeah. Totally. I totally agree. And I've been on both sides of like on the executive team and, you know, where you're thinking about what exactly do I want to pull the board into and not, I've been on the board side and it's, and ultimately, as you know, like, the more collaborative that yeah. can be, especially in the early stage, totally. like, you know, board investors want to be there to help, but nailing this before you scale it is so valuable, hard, very hard to do. But what about the remote work thing? Um, yeah. How have you seen that impacting either your business from a customer standpoint or from the way you're building and running your teams? 
Any differences yeah. in the last 24 months? Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was hard, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I say was, cause we're coming out of it. And um, I actually feel like, you know, there's been, I've been on the road a ton the last couple of months. I think there was so much pent up demand that now my kids are like, wait, mom, <laughs> like I thought you were going to get know, your old job oh, back, mom. I know. Like, so trying to strike the right balance in all seriousness, but um, it was really hard. I think about, you know, we doubled the company um, while we were all remote um, at least. And so all these people came on and didn't yet know their, um, you know, their colleagues. And, uh, and then of course had all the challenges that, that specific to every individual, right. Of what working from home meant to that individual. And, um, and I think it's factored into what we've all been calling this great resignation because like people haven't been as connected to the core. It's a lot easier for me to resign to you if I've never met you oh. and, you know, and I, I haven't met my colleagues. So I think it's really important as leaders and, you know, in our companies that we think about, okay, what is our new world of work? What are we going to do going forward? And, um, and how are we going to keep people connected and productive and flexible and all those things? So for us, for example, at Confluent, we are remote first um, and we're hybrid. We do have office space. We're rethinking how we use our offices. It's more of a collaboration space by function, by team, declare sort of when you're going to be into the, in the office together. Um, to stay connected, to collaborate, et cetera. And um, so that's kind of the broad strokes and we're putting the finer points on it, but um, people need connection as well as all the great productivity and flexibility that comes from not having to commute. Yeah, and are, are you guys, um, did you do anything along the way in terms of the cadence of how you manage the teams or report it out that help people? Because I, 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 one of the issues, we were just having a board meeting conversation about this is, you know, people used to get there every, together every Monday and there was a big yeah. meeting and they would all go to lunch afterwards and do this. Well, when you meet for that one hour on a Monday and everybody goes off and does their separate things for the week, you just don't have that same continuity. And so I'm just curious if you guys put yeah. anything into place that was helpful along the way. Well, I mean, when we were all remote, yes, we would try. We actually met a little more frequently, like as an executive team, we met more frequently, albeit virtual, but at least we, we probably logged more hours together than we would have had we not been virtual. And we um, added on to it, you know, the virtual happy hours and that sort of thing. And so we did that across different teams. Now that we're coming back and we're able to be hybrid, we are trying to be really intentional about, okay, for every team, what is the right cadence to get together in person and mm -hmm. how do we use that time? So for my leadership team, we're getting together twice a quarter for like a day, day and a half in person okay. um, and trying to keep it focused on more, you know, planning and discussion and strategy where we can actually like, you know, collaborate together. Um, other, our sales teams, for example, are coming into the office in most locations every Tuesday for our outbound pipe gen days. Um, yes, everyone can be productive from home, but it's great to come in, do a team huddle in That's the morning, cool. um, do the work, you know, go to lunch together. So kind of balancing like the work and the fun. So I think being intentional and being um, specific, by, you know, by function, by team um, is really helpful. And what about um, you guys are in the cloud infrastructure space, just maybe just talk broadly, not specific to Confluent, but like, I'm not sure the world at large really understands what we talk about. We say cloud infrastructure, other than sort of like AWS and maybe GCP and Azure, people are like, oh yeah, you run your infrastructure. But what are some yeah. of the things that are happening that are exciting that you, that you look at and just say, gosh, this is, I mean, because we see it yeah. as investors and board members. I mean, we just oh, see, yeah. I, I was with a friend of mine who runs Deloitte's technology practice. And he was like, Jeff, you know, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom in the market, but he's like, we have every Fortune 1000 company in the world committing yeah. to multi-year projects with us across all these different technology platforms. Like this is just, we're still in the early days of kind of an unstoppable force. I'm just curious if you have any broad yeah. stroke comments on the cloud space. Yeah, for sure. And it's, um, you know, it is exactly why, like when I came into New Relic and learned a lot about what was going on in the um, kind of developer led and cloud infrastructure space, I knew that my next company was also going to be in the cloud and data infrastructure space because it is where the biggest disruption is happening in enterprise tech. Um, as you pointed out, we're still in very early innings of public cloud adoption. That's, uh, you know, the minority of enterprise workloads are still not yet in the public cloud. 
So this is a you know multi-year, multi-decade journey, which is so exciting. And these markets are huge, as you know. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the um, the biggest proxy for like you know what's happening in cloud infrastructure is people are you know relying on managed services from other vendors, starting with the cloud providers for basic compute and storage. Yeah. Then you've got all these other services that are now available in the cloud, like ours, a data streaming platform, and like many others. Um, you know, whether it's MongoDB or Databricks or Snowflake. And, um, you know, many of them started as open source uh, capabilities like Kafka was the kind of original genesis of Confluent. And so what companies did is, you know, again, back to like, um, you know, the developers who've acquired, you know, all companies are trying to hire more developers and engineers and developing a lot more custom apps. Um, and they're relying on a lot of these open source technologies initially, and then you get to the point where, well, gosh, that's kind of expensive to manage it on our own and have infrastructure and engineers doing it. So now they're looking to, you know, Confluent and other companies as managed service providers to deliver that as a service because it's more scalable, reliable, you know, enterprise ready, um, and allows companies to redirect that engineering talent to building, you know, competitive differentiating capabilities. So it's public cloud, and then it's all these other managed services that are now available in the cloud um, that help companies modernize their um, their architecture and build competitive advantage in the digital age. So it's super exciting. It's really fun. And lastly, I know you're a uh, you've you've been an angel investor in some companies, sat on some boards, advised a lot of founders. What do you look for? I'm just curious when you're when you meet somebody and you walk away and go, oh my gosh, I have to invest with this person. I don't know. Just curious what, what you look for well, when you meet a founder and go, oh my gosh, that, that person got me really excited. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I'm still learning, right? This is a new kind of learning journey for me. So I'm learning from people like you and others. But um, I do look for, you know, I, I, I appreciate that like the idea, the tech, the problem that that founder might be solving might evolve, will likely evolve over time. So it's a little bit of like, who is this person? How do they think about things? How will they be adaptable to like find the problem so um, over time? And, you know, so ultimately like at a really early stage, it's a bet on the person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I had to learn that right. Versus a bet on, <laughs> this, you know, we, we've um, all learned that. <laughs> great. And, um, and it, it doesn't mean they have to be a, you know, multiple, uh, you know, time founder. Um, but I'm looking much as I look for, as I mentioned earlier in operating execs, it's like that growth mindset, that, you know, ability to observe and learn and pivot, um, is just so valuable. Yeah. It's, uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day with David Fialco, who's one of the founders of general catalyst. And he said, Everybody says it's 99% of the, about the founder. And he said, I'm here to tell you it's a hundred percent. It's just, I like it. yeah. and we see it over and over and over. Whereas venture firms, you overthink the market or the product yeah. or whatever. And at the yeah. end of the day, it's amazing what these like just outlier people go on to create. In many cases, it looks nothing like the original pitch. Totally. Um, yeah. Totally. No, that's exactly right. You think about it, like even in a company our size, you know, it's still debatable, like ask different analysts what the TAM is exactly. So how can somebody at like pre-seed stage, you know, clearly define the TAM? You can't. Okay. Um, so it really does become about the founder and their ability to bring, find the right problem. Hey, lastly, um, just on a personal level as an exec, you know, in tech, which is stressful, you're a parent, you're, uh, you know, happily married. What do you do to keep yourself sharp and recharged and any, any tips you'd pass along to people? I, I, over the last six months in particular, I'm seeing a lot of people in our industry who are very stressed. It's been, we kind of went through this crazy pandemic period. Uh, You know, I have four kids. It's been crazy. Uh, Now we're sort of thought we were coming out of it and then, whoa, maybe we're not, but what have, what have you done? Any tips you could share with people that you've done to keep yourself sharp? And you mentioned you love coaching and self-learning, any other things you'd share? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. Um, And I'd say it's a constant work in progress. You know, if I'm honest, there's moments where I'm like nailing it. And there's other moments where I'm like, oh my God, I'm like totally um, not, you know, spending my time in the ways I want to spend my time. So I'm I'm sure you can relate, but um, trying to play offense as much as I can. I often feel like I'm playing defense. A lot of it comes down to like, 
relentless calendar management. So we can have all these intentions in the world of like, I want to have dinner with my family every night and I don't want to work at night or I don't, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, but then to make that true, it's like relentless calendar management. So I'm kind of maniacal about, um, you know, what's on the calendar making, you know, if I have to prep for a customer meeting, that time goes on the calendar, just so I'm really real about like, where my time is going. And if there's, you know, some event I want to go to with my kids, a sports event, this or that, or even just like once in a while, I want to drive them to practice, right. um, whatever it is, I put it on the calendar and it's yeah. blocked. And so I can do that. So, you know, time to work out to keep myself sane um, goes on the calendar. So that's kind of the big one. And, um, and then you have to be a little flexible, like maybe you hadn't planned on it, but your kids need you for something or, mm-hmm. you know, another family member does, or, mm-hmm. Um, you have to go on a trip that you didn't plan for. So you got to balance it out. So I kind of say like, take a portfolio approach. Some days and weeks are great. <laughs> Some days and weeks are not. Yeah. Um, and on balance, hopefully, you know, we get it mostly right. And I think you said at the beginning, I, I had a, a younger founder who said to me the other day, he's like, oh man, you seem like you have it all figured out on the home front. I was like, huh. Nobody has it all figured out. <laughs> I Nobody. certainly don't. I know. It's hard. I know. It's I hard. love it. Sometimes yeah. I, you know, I laugh and I, I know you can relate because you have some teenage kids. Like uh, it's, you know, I'll, I'll say to my kids like, hey, you need to do your homework. And, you know, you get the pushback and I'm like, huh, how is managing my 11 year old right now harder than like you know, <laughs> managing something at work? But I guess it keeps us grounded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, Erica, great to see you. Thanks for doing this. I know people yeah. will love hearing from you. And I know every time you talk to our founders and, and go to market execs, they love it. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Great to see you and go Warriors. Go Warriors. All right. right. Take care. Yeah. Bye. 